on this first Sunday in April. And as uh, I asked the Lord for what to share with you today, he guided my attention to 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. Now I will be reading the first 13 verses, 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. Now we'll be reading verses 1 through 13. Please bear with me um, the length of uh, the reading, but I want to give you a complete picture so that you have the backdrop of where I am going. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 13. If you have it, signify by standing for the reading of the word. First Corinthians chapter number 10, verses one through 13. Lift your Bibles, your sword in the air. However you have it electronically or paper, lift it in the air to let the devil know you came packing today. I'll repeat after me, this is my Bible. I can have what it says I can have. I can do what it says I can do. I can be who it says I can be. Today I'm going to be taught from the word of God. I boldly confess that my heart is alert. My mind is receptive. I am about to receive the incorruptible, indestructible, ever-living seed of the word of God. Now declare I'll never be the same. I'll never be the same. I will never be the same. In Jesus' name. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, 1 through 13. In the New Living Translation, it reads like this. I don't want you to forget, dear brothers and sisters, about our ancestors in the wilderness long ago. All of them were guided by a cloud that moved ahead of them, and all of them walked through the sea on dry ground. In the cloud and in the sea, all of them were baptized as followers of Moses. All of them ate the same spiritual food, and all of them drank the same spiritual water. For they drank from the spiritual rock that traveled with them, and that rock was Christ. Yet God was not pleased with most of them, and their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. These things happened as a warning to us so that we would not crave evil things as they did or worship idols as some of them did. As the scriptures say, the people celebrated with feasting and drinking and they indulged in pagan revelry. And we must not engage in sexual immorality as some of them did causing 23,000 of them to die in one day. Nor should we put Christ to the test, as some of them did, and then died from snake bites. And don't grumble, as some of them did, and then were destroyed by the angel of death. These things happened to them as an example. Somebody say an example. Example for us. They were written down to warn us who live at the end of the age. If you think you are standing strong, be careful not to fall. The temptation in your life are no different from what others experience, and God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. The word of the Lord is already blessed. If you allow me a few minutes of your time for this brief Sunday school lesson, I want to preach from the subject, learning from the mistakes of the past. Learning from the mistakes of the past. Let us pray. Father, we bless your name. We thank you for this time of divine proclamation. We thank you for how you've manifested your presence here in such a powerful, tangible way. Now we need your presence even more as we stand uh, at this sacred desk to proclaim 
the word of God to your people. Lord, take my mind, use it as your own. Take my voice and speak the words that you would have me to speak. Preach now, Lord God, through your servant. Speak now for your servant hears. In the mighty matchless name of Jesus the Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Learning from the mistakes of the past. It is contributed to Ben Franklin, one of the fathers of this country, um, and it is assessed to him um, as the person that popularized the quote, experience is the best teacher, but a fool will learn from no other. It is an unwise man or woman that can only learn from having to experience the consequences of poor choices and behaviors. I don't have to experience alcoholism and drug addiction to know that it could devastate my life. Why is that? Because I watched it do that to several of my uncles and several of my family members and my friends. Uh, we can and we should learn to avoid certain mistakes and behaviors that are detrimental, detrimental to us uh, by gleaning from the experiences and the wisdom of, of those that preceded us. And that's one of the reasons uh, that I love talking to the elderly because they have so much wisdom um, and they have learned so much in the years that they have been on this earth and their wisdom uh, can be a warning to us not to do some of the things that their peers did. Because whether you believe it or not, um, if you follow in the same path and that path led to destruction, uh, you are going to be uh, experiencing destruction yourselves. Uh, those experiences, these experiences of our predecessors and and those around us are not limited to those that we are familiar with personally, uh, but they include those whose experiences are also chronicled in the biblical text. And we need to learn from uh, our spiritual predecessors uh, when we read and when we study uh, the biblical text. In the text today for this sermon, we find the Apostle Paul is admonishing the church at Corinth, and as he is admonishing the church at Corinth, he is also admonishing us today. And he is telling us, he is warning us, he is, is trying to get our attention to give us a message that we need to be mindful and careful to avoid repeating the mistakes of our predecessors. The Corinthian church was a very diverse church, and uh, the members of the Corinthian church were very mixed. There were both Jews and Gentiles in the Corinthian church, and the Corinthian church also uh, boasted uh, that they had many nationalities represented there, and um, there were a diversity in an economic status, and there was a diversity in social classes in the Corinthian church. Corinth uh, was known as a very wealthy um, area in ancient time, but it was known as a wealthy area with no class. So they had money, but they didn't have any class. I know that y'all don't know anybody like that now, but uh, back in the day... <clears throat> Corinth was seen as a very uh, carnal city. Uh, whatever you could do and wanted to do and was grown enough to do, you could do it in Corinth. Corinth was like Amsterdam and Las Vegas all wrapped up in one. And the church at Corinth was smack dab in the middle of this environment. And unfortunately, instead of impacting uh, the darkness of the society, the Corinthian church allowed some of the darkness of the society to impact them. The church at Corinth was a very carnal church and in an extremely worldly city. And the challenge of this church was to stand as the beacon of light for Christ in an atmosphere heavy in darkness. The challenge of this church was to be in the world, but not of the world. 
The challenge of this church was to influence and dispel the darkness of sin and not allow the darkness to influence them. And so Paul is encouraging them to take spiritual inventory of themselves and to be watchful of themselves. In this diverse community, Paul needs a foundation upon which to build his argument that everyone, Jew and Gentile, no matter what class, no matter what nationality, he needs a foundation that he can start to build uh, his argument on that everyone in that church could relate to. And so Paul chooses to build the foundation of his argument upon the Exodus story. Somebody say Exodus. Uh, to make his point, Paul uses language and imagery and raises familiar themes that establishes commonality between the children of Israel of the past, the Corinthian church, and also us today. Look at how he begins this discourse. Paul says, I don't want you to be unaware. I don't want you to be ignorant, my brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were under the cloud and they all passed through the sea and were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and the sea and they all ate from the same spiritual food and they all drank from the same spiritual drink for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Jesus Christ. Paul invokes common themes of the Exodus story that are familiar to the saints at Corinth, uh, whether they were Jews or Jews. Gentiles, and they are familiar to us today in the year 2019. What are those themes, preacher? Well, I'm glad you asked. Baptism. We understand and we know the significance of baptism, spiritual food and spiritual drink. In 2019, we know that that refers to the Eucharist or the Lord's Supper that we will be participating in later on in the service. God delivered the children of Israel from the hands of Pharaoh uh, um, and, and his army. God manifests his presence in the form of a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night to guide and to lead them. He provided manna from heaven and quail every morning in the wilderness wilderness to sustain them and he caused water to come out of a rock in order to quench their thirst when they cried out unto him that they were thirsty in the wilderness. God showed extraordinary favor towards his people and he manifested his grace and his power in an extraordinary way and yet they still sinned. They still turned their backs from God. They still lusted after other idols. They still disobeyed God. And the Bible says in verse 5, nevertheless, God was not pleased with them. And they were struck down in the wilderness. They died before they got to the promised land. The Bible says now these things occur. As an example, somebody say example. Example to us so that we might, des might not desire evil as they did. Uh, can I share a few areas that the Israelites went astray on uh, so that we can learn from their mistakes and not repeat their mistakes and then reap the consequences that they reap? Can I share with you? Yes. First point is this, if you're taking notes. The children of Israel took God's presence for granted. Children of Israel took God's presence for granted. As I stated earlier, God delivered them mightily out of the hand of Pharaoh and his army at the Red Sea. He led them by a cloud during the day and pillar of fire by night demonstrated his proximity to, him, to them. God was with them. And he manifests his presence to let him know let them know he was there. He was with them. And he was leading them. He fed them with supernatural food. And yet, as soon as the opportunity arose, they fell into idolatry. As soon as Moses went up into the mountain and stayed too long, they said, maybe he did. Maybe he ain't coming back. We 
we need to make our own God. And so they said, Aaron, here's our jewelry, here's our gold. Meld it down and make a God for us so that we can worship that God. That quickly, after God had manifest himself in such a powerful way in their lives, um, that quickly after God had delivered them, from Egypt that quickly after God had performed a miracle and took them across the Red Sea on dry land and then drowned Pharaoh in his army that quickly because Moses took too long. They lusted after other gods. When we begin to take God's presence for granted, we diminish his divinity in our minds and we lessen his holiness. Then we begin to look for other things to fill the void that only God can fill in our lives. And when we begin to do that, when we begin to put other things before God, when we begin to prioritize other things before God, my brothers and sisters, it may not be a little idol that you pray to. It may not be a little statue that you bow down to, but anything that you put before God in your life is now an idol and you are worshiping an idol. I don't care what it is it could be your job it could be your family it could be power it could be money it could be prestige anything that you schedule in your life and prioritize in your life above God has has your worship and has become your God Bible says that the children of Israel began to lust after other gods and the consequences of their actions was death. Aren't you glad that we're under grace? We need to recognize that God manifests his presence among his people. And when God manifests his presence among his people, that is a privilege and a blessing for us. When God shows up, whether during our early morning prayer during the week, whether uh, our prayer workshop on yesterday or whether Sunday morning service, it's a blessing that we cannot take lightly. It is a privilege that we cannot take for granted. God doesn't have to show up at Ebenezer Baptist Church. He can write Ichabod on the door. The spirit of the Lord has departed, but God graces us with his presence. And when he graces us with his presence, uh, we know need to respond to his presence with nothing other than pure unadulterated worship that's the only it's the only acceptable response when the God of the universe shows up in our midst Paul points out that God provided the Israel with supernatural food and drink to sustain them during the exodus from Egypt to the promised land and for us, this is a foreshadowing of the Last Supper where Jesus uses the bread and the wine as an object lesson. And he uses it and teaches them that the bread and the wine represents his body that will be broken for us and his blood that will be shed for us. And the foundation of our celebration of the Lord's Supper that we will celebrate later on in the service however the text informs us that the children of Israel complained somebody say complained oh my goodness they complained about God's provision they complained about how God took care of them they complained they were hungry in the wilderness God manifested manna something that they had never seen before something that no other people has ever seen again manifested manna from heaven to feed them and then caused quail to supernaturally gather uh, in the camp every morning so that they had bread and they had meat and after all of that Nevertheless, the children of Israel complained. Yeah. I want collard greens today. 
Why can't we have chicken? Where's the macaroni and cheese? Supernatural food. Provided for them in a supernatural way. And all they could do was complain. And as a result of their complaining, some of them died. Thank God. Oh, y'all need to shout right there that we under grace. I don't know how many folks would be dead. My second point is this. Be careful that we appreciate God's provision. The children of Israel failed to realize that God had given them something that no one else in history had experienced. Manna from heaven and he bent the laws of nature to cause water to come forth from a rock and provided quail for them in abundance, yet they still complained. Saints, let's not be found with an ungrateful spirit when it comes to God's provision. It may not be what you want. But God has provided what you need. And his word tells us he will provide all of our needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Uh, You may not have the car that you want, but thank God you got a car at all. You could be walking. Uh, You may have to take the bus, but thank God there is a bus uh, near you that can take you where you need to go. There are some places where there is no bus to take you anywhere. You have to walk wherever you have to go. There's no public transportation system. You may not have the amount of money that you want, but thank God you got two nickels to rub together and you got enough money to take care of your needs. You may not have the job that you think you should have, but thank God you have a job that you can go to. And while you are thanking God and working faithfully on that job, put your resume out and see if you can find yourself another job. The Bible says, and in all things, we are to give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning us. Be thankful for what God has provided for you. Because I believe that if we're thankful to God for the small things, if we're thankful to God for the little things, if we are found faithful in the little, if we're found faithful in the small things, then God says, oh yeah, that's a brother, that's a sister I can trust. Let me give you more. But if we're not thankful in the small things, if we're not thankful for what God has provided for us, why do you think God would increase? Why would you think God would enlarge you if you're not thankful for what you have? I'm almost done because I see y'all get nervous in the service. That's all right. The biblical text teaches us, number one, not to take God's presence for granted. It's a privilege anytime God shows up. Number two, appreciate God's provision. God doesn't have to take care of us. Everything we have, he owns it. He lends it to us to be good stewards over it. And he provides everything that we need. But this is my last point and then I'm going to be done. And number three, God provided an exodus for their sin. See, going back to the original theme Verse 13 says, no testing has overtaken you that is not common to everyone. God is faithful and he will not let you be tested beyond your strength. But with the testing, he will also provide a way of escape where we will be able to endure it. Can I break this verse down a little bit? Uh, No testing has overtaken you that is not common to everyone. What you going through, uh, boo, I'm sorry to tell you, but you ain't the only one going through it. You think you're the only one that don't nobody understand. Trust me, there are people that went through it before you. There's people going through it right now. And after you are dead and gone, there's going to be some people going through the same thing that you're going through. Don't let the devil trick you and fool you into into thinking that don't nobody understand what you're going through. Yes, 
somebody understands what you're going through. And, and most likely, this very person that understands what you're going through is sitting here in this congregation right now. And that's why testimony is so important because uh, the word of God says we overcome or we are victorious over the enemy by number one, the blood of the lamb, and number two, the word of our testimony. Some of y'all deliverance is, is, is based on the testimony of somebody else. Some people are afraid. I'm just, I don't want to tell my testimony because, you know, I, 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 they might think uh, uh, negative about me. So what? Yeah, you went through it. God delivered you from it. You need to tell somebody else so that they can be delivered. You ain't the only one that struggled with drug addiction. You ain't the only one that had a baby out of wedlock. You ain't the only one that has been homeless. You ain't the only one. But the key is thanks be unto God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ. So don't let the devil play you and tell you, hey, don't nobody else understand. They're going to look down on you. So what? Tell your testimony. Be a witness unto God that, yeah, I went through that, but I don't look like what I've been through. God gave me a way out. God gave me a way of escape. Even when I didn't want to come out, he came in and snatched me out and brought me out. Because God is faithful. Even when we're not faithful, he's faithful. And so watch this. He will allow a test to come in your life. However, with the test, God is going to give an exit. And he does this so that we are able to handle the test. But this is the key. You got to know God well enough that when he shows you an exit, you recognize the exit. That's the first thing. You got to know God well enough that when he shows it to you, you recognize it's an exit. And when you recognize it's an exit, pack your bag. Yes. Don't think that you are going to be victorious over your test doing it the way you want to do it. If you say, oh, well, I see the exit, but you know, I can, ha I can handle this because, you know, some tests are good to us. Some things that are meant to destroy us. Can I talk? Can I preach it? Like feel good to us. And so it's hard to leave out of situations that are satisfying your flesh. But what the devil doesn't tell you is that, yeah, you, you stay there and get hooked if you want to. Uh, but eventually, I'm going to require your life. Because the wages of sin is still death. That ain't changed. But the gift of God is eternal life and so you gotta you gotta understand that with the test God has already provided your victory he's already provided your way of escape he's already provided your exit he's already provided your exodus so that we can bear and endure the testing the way of escape that God has provided is Jesus Christ. Amen. 
He is our way out of sin. He is the one that has paid the price. It is his blood that paid the price for your sin, my sin. I don't care what your sin is. I don't care what you've done. I don't care what you're going to do when you leave here. You're still doing You did it last night. You're going to do it this afternoon. Doesn't matter. The blood of Jesus has paid for all of that. And then some for all of us. And so we are able to bear up under our temptation because Jesus Christ is our way out. He is our exodus. He is our exit door. We just need to take the exit door when he reveals it to us. Don't fall into sin and reap the consequences like the children of Israel did. God has provided a way of escape and that's Jesus. And so there's a way out. There's an exit out of an ungrateful spirit. And that's recognizing how good Jesus has been to you. There's an exit. There's a way out. There's an exodus out of a complaining spirit. Understand that God is calling for us to speak his word and to speak positivity. He, he's calling for us to speak um, his word over situations. There's an exit. There's an exodus out of addiction. Amen. You don't have to struggle with it any longer. And there's others that were there and got delivered and could tell you how to get out. Amen. Because God not only can do it for them, but they can do it for you as well. There's an exit out of the spirit of lust. And, and adultery. You don't have to jump from bed to bed to bed, but God will love you better than anybody else can love you. There is an exit. There is an exodus out of your anger. God will f touch that place in you that was hurt. Uh, that is the root of that anger and heal the root of it. There's an exodus. There's an exit out of your sickness. There is an exodus. There's an exit out of your depression. There is an exit out of your worry. There's an exit out of your unforgiveness. There's an exit out of sin and his name is Jesus Christ. And as I take my seat, I want to encourage you now. If you see the exit and you see your freedom, come out, come out, come out of whatever you're in come out of whatever sin it's bound you come out whatever you're struggling with come out Jesus is the exit come out come out come out, come out.